you ever met somebody and you heard about them before you met them, but after you met them, what you heard about them, eh, you were like, eh, not so much. Have you ever met somebody who you heard a little bit about, you thought, well, okay, cool, I'll, I'll meet them. And then you meet them and you're like blown away? Well, this video is about you must make everything match the brand. Because here's what, you, here's what all of us would like to happen in some aspect, in some area of our lives. We would like for our reputation to precede us. In other words, like our reputation opens doors for us that we couldn't open for ourselves. But here's what we don't want. We cannot afford to have our reputation exceed us when our, when our reputation precedes us. So I'm gonna read a story in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse one. And when the queen of Sheba had heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with very great train and camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. And there was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom. Now, isn't that fascinating? When she had seen all of Solomon's wisdom, what does wisdom look like? How could she see his wisdom? Well, it's going to tell us. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and the ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said, to the king, it was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom, how be it, I believe not the words until, my, until I came and mine eyes have seen it. Now watch what she says next. And behold, the half was not told me, thy wisdom and thy prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. What? When was the last time you met somebody and the reality of them superseded the reputation of them? I mean, when was the last time that happened? It don't happen very often in life where you actually meet somebody, thank you, where you meet somebody and what you learn after you meet them is greater than what you heard before you met them. And, and, and the reason that happened is because Solomon, in the wisdom that God had given him, was obsessed over making sure he didn't misrepresent the brand. And by the way, as followers of Christ, we have to make sure we don't misrepresent the brand. I gotta make sure that the things people hear me say don't misrepresent the brand. I gotta make sure the things people see me do don't misrepresent, misrepresent the brand. I gotta make sure when people come into my space that my space doesn't misrepresent the brand. Because I'm not just representing me. I'm representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I wanna make sure that my representation matches that brand. I have a friend of mine, my brother who's a pastor, he's here today, and a lady who goes to his church said to me one time, said, Myron, and she wasn't, she wasn't being obtuse, she was just curious. She says, why do you talk about money and business so much? And I said, because I don't want to misrepresent Christ in the marketplace because God is a God of abundance. The kingdom of God is a family business. And I know that's a, those, those, are very, very, those are very, those are very bold statements and not thought of within the realm of what we call Christianity, right? In fact, I did a video on how I read books, right? How to get, like, called Read and Grow Rich, how to get more out of the books you read. And somebody left a comment. Here's what they said. This is, this is fascinating to me. They said, um, doesn't the Bible talk about being rich? I thought you were a man of God. Are you a Mason? Like, <laughs> what? Where did that come from? So my comment was, um, the Bible has a lot of things to say about that. I said, so, no, I said, was Abraham a man of God? That's what I said. Was Abraham a man of God? The Bible has a whole lot to say about being rich. Why don't, the first time the word rich is mentioned in the Bible, it's in Genesis chapter 13, verse number two. 
why don't you go read that, if you're so inclined, and come back and let me know what you find. And I wasn't being obtuse. I was just saying like, like here's, the, here's, where, here's, here's one of the reasons I believe the brand of Christ has been so misrepresented in the world, in, in churches as well as in the marketplace. Because most, I won't say most because I, I haven't measured it, many, okay, I wanna be accurate, many pastors don't study. And far too many do not teach the Bible in context. They read a verse and holler, and sometimes in their notes it seems like they say, weak point, say it louder, right? <laughs> sometimes, like saying something louder doesn't make it more true. And, and, so, and so what happens is they preach what's, so they're, they're okay, I, I wasn't planning on going here, but I might as well to get, put this whole thing in context. There are three different types of sermons that you're gonna to listen to, it's for those of you who are watching out there in the YouTube sphere. There are topical sermons. And a topical sermon is you read a verse and you, you talk about a topic. Now, I know this for a fact because I used to be one. Most topical preachers come up with an idea and try to find a verse that matches to prove their point. I call that proof texting. The reason, and it's not texting proof to somebody, okay? <laughs> okay, they're, they're trying to use the text to prove their idea. And what happens is you have a whole bunch of preachers with fragmented theology because the way they preach the Bible is in a fragmented method. And so what they do is they lift a verse out of context they teach a philosophy, attempt to prove it with a Bible verse, and so that's why you have so many confused people in churchianity, because they got their doctrine from the preacher and not from the Bible. I'm glad that when I was a kid, I was a teenager, I started reading the Bible for myself. I was allowed to do that, right? In fact, it was highly recommended. And I started reading the Bible for myself, and when I heard the preacher say something, that wasn't substantiated in what I saw in the Bible, I believe the Bible over the preacher. By the way, that's a good thing because here's what the possible, uh, um, man, in the book of Acts it says that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things the apostles were teaching were true. Now if they're checking up on the apostles and I think you don't need to check up on me I'm the one that's confused. And if, I'm list, if, if they needed to list, check up on the apostles and I'm listening to a preacher and I think I don't need to check up, make sure this joker know what they're talking about, I'm confused. I remember I got in trouble one time. I went to a Christian school and the pastor believed in a doctrine that I didn't believe in, okay? And I didn't believe in it because I studied the Bible. And the, you know, I, hey, I said, believe what you want to believe. We'll find out when we get there, Right? And so he believed in the doctrine that you can lose your salvation, like you can get saved and then lose it. I didn't believe that. I believed that if you're saved, you're saved for all eternity. It's called eternal life. It's not called temporary life. If it was eternal, you couldn't lose it. And if you can lose it, it wasn't eternal. I don't know. That seems simple enough to me. But he asked me in our Bible class in front of the other students if I believed you could lose your salvation. And I said, no. And he said, well, what about this verse? I said, well, I think it means this. He said, well, what about that verse? Well, I think it means this. And like, he basically told me off and embarrassed me in front of the class. I didn't even go back to school the next day. In fact, I literally, this was two weeks before my graduation, I literally contemplated quitting school that day. I was like, I'm done. But I didn't. I didn't quit. I'm glad I didn't quit. But I just decided a long time ago, I decided when I came to Christ, and my brother will tell you this, I decided I am not gonna play with God. Because when I came home and told my mom, I got saved. She said, that's nice, baby. I told my brother, there's no shame in it, pastor. You weren't a pastor then. You were just a regular, you were my little brother who had seen me act a fool most of my life. So I can't blame you for thinking this. I told him, yeah, I got saved. He, said, he didn't say this to me, but he said it to himself, I'll give him two weeks. And am I, am I, isn't that what you thought? Because he knew me. He probably knew me better than anybody. He's the brother who's closest to me in age. He probably knew me better than any other person on earth. And he, he gave me two weeks. But he didn't realize I'm not the one that made the change. 
And I decided when I came to Christ, like I ain't fixed, like I had a bad temper. I used to cuss the wallpaper off a wall, fight at the drop of a hat and sometimes throw down two hats. Anyway, I'm not gonna misrepresent Christ in the marketplace. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna let the words that come out of my mouth, the actions that come out of my life, I'm not gonna let it misrepresent who I say I represent. So everything has to match the brand. So, all that, here's what, in fact, Christ was so intent and intentional on not misrepresenting his brand. Remember I said earlier, I said, the kingdom of God is a family business. Why do I say that? Because when Mary and Joseph lost Christ for a day because he, was, he had already been bar mitzvahed, so he was an adult, they didn't feel like they needed to babysit a 12-year-old because 12 is the number of perfect government, by the way. And there's a whole biblical concept of parenting that is totally missed in our day of 34-year-old adolescence. Anyway, that's a, another conversation for a different day. Um, and so, so when they came and they found him, he said, they, um, Joseph said, your mother and I, we were, wor- no, Mary said, your father and I were worried about you. And Jesus was like, he, I, no disrespect, but he ain't my father. And he said, woman, not, not, not woman, but like, dear lady, don't you know I must be about my father's business? I'm, in other words, I'm 12 years old. I got to be representing. I got to be representing the family business. And here's what it says. John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. So the, the first thing I want to say about everything has to match the brand. Everything you say has to match the brand. Now, I'm talking about the brand of the kingdom of God, but whatever brand of business you're building also, everything that you say has to match that brand. Right? I, I, okay, so here's what it says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. Cool, that's pretty cool. And in him was the life, and the life, in him was the light, and the light, in him was the life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, darkness comprehended it not. You go down to verse 14, here's what it says. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now, when you understand that the Bible's not just, the Bible's not a book about religion at all. It contains religion, it's not about religion. And God didn't even start the first religion. Satan did that in Genesis chapter 3. And the first religion was hedonism. If you disobey God, you get to be God. Let that one grow on you. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. So the word became flesh. The Bible is a book of patterns. That's a pattern. The interpretation of that is the word, which is God and was with God, and that made the world became flesh. That's the interpretation. But an application is this. When our word becomes our flesh, we can dwell among the people we gave our word to. When we don't, when our word does not become our flesh, we have to hide from those very same people. Mm, I wish I had some help in here. And then here's what it says. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory that we only got only begotten of the Father. So when people, when your word becomes your flesh, people can behold your glory, then and only then can they believe your story. What does it say? What does it say in Matthew chapter five? It says, um, ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine where? Before men that they may what? See your good works and glorify who? Your father which is in heaven. See how it all matches up? Like everything has to match the brand. I can't go around. Uh, B.R. Lakin used to say, he said, you think just because a man's a preacher he's supposed to drive a rattle trap car and wear hand-me-down clothes and walk around looking like an advance agent for the rag man. I don't believe that. Amen. Amen. Right? And so we, be- we have this idea that just because somebody's following God, they're supposed to be broke as a joke and ready to choke. That is not a biblical concept. It's a Catholic concept. It's not a biblical concept. The first time the word rich is mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about Abraham. After God told him, if you will leave where I'm telling you to leave and you'll go to a place I'm going to show you, I'm going to bless you in ways you can't bless yourself, make you something you can't make yourself, give you something you can't get yourself. I'm going to take the source of your shame, make it the source of your fame. 
I'm going to bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you, and then you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed, even though they're stupid enough not to know they're blessed, and they want to curse the people of God. Anyway, that's another conversation for a different day also. We live in a world that's confused by what they call the news, and the news ain't news, it's old. It ain't new, it's old. And all it is is a form of mind control and propaganda, but that's... Here's what God said. God said, if you will do that, I'm going to bless you. Guess what it says in the next chapter, second verse? And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. That's the first time the word rich is used in the Bible. By the way, that word rich there is the word, is the word asher. Ein, it's spelled ein shin resh, asher. Well, oftentimes in the Hebrew, when you spell words backwards, you take the same letters you spell them backwards, they mean the opposite of the word that was spelled forward. Are y'all tracking? So the word is a sure, ein shin reish. Well, there's another word that's spelled reish shin ein. Sometimes they take the shin out, it's just um, 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 reish ein, um, which is ra. So rasha, what is rasha? Rasha is the backwards of a sure. Well, when you think of the opposite of rich, what would you think that is? Poor, exactly. But when you spell Ashur backwards, it spells Rosha, and Rosha means evil. Now, it's not implying at all that people are poor because they're evil. But I think something that we've all noticed is that societies that are predominantly evil tend to be, and anti-God, are poor societies. Wow, that's fascinating, isn't it? So, everything has to match the brand. Make sure the words that come out of your mouth match the brand, the words that you say. It says, when the queen of Sheba, see, y'all thought I forgot where I was. I didn't forget. I'm paying very close attention. When the queen of Sheba had heard of the fame of Solomon, that's what it says, 1 Kings chapter 10, when the queen of Sheba had heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. Now, here's what's really interesting. She heard of the fame of Solomon. How did she hear of the fame of Solomon? Boom. He's on the top 10 charts every week, right? How long? Long enough to go through a, um, a thousand songs. The scripture says in, um, in 1 Kings chapter 4, he wrote 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. Let me ask you a question. Does your, do your proverbs and your songs match the brand? What does that mean? Well, Solomon, so I've got social media. Let me ask you this. Proverbs were 3,000 proverbs. You know what you could translate that to today? 3,000 Instagram posts? Okay, 1,000 Instagram posts, 1,000 Facebook posts, 1,000 Twitter posts. He put his content out into the marketplace so people could be blessed by it. I don't, I don't use social media. Okay. The people that you desire to reach use it. And you ain't gonna, hey, hey, you ain't gonna reach them where you are, you're gonna have to reach them where they are. Hey, thanks for watching this video. I hope you're enjoying it, but I want to take some time to invite you to join us at the Make More Offers Challenge. The Make More Offers Challenge, we do it once a month where I invite a bunch of entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs to come and have me teach them in detail the four moves that can scale any business. I want to invite you to join us on the Make More Offers Challenge. Click the link in the description below. You will be glad you did. Join as a VIP and you can make the rest of your life the best of your life. And now, back to the video you were watching. So here's a question I got for you. The post that you put on your social media platform, do they match the brand of Christ and do they match the brand of a Christ-centered business? Or do you have posts on your social media that have profanity in them? Ooh, did I say that? Yeah, I said it. Because the scripture says that out of the same mouth should not proceed blessings and cursings. Out of the same fountain should not proceed sweet water and bitter. People are so confused. 
I mean, I mean, confused. I had a dude ask me last week now, last week, if he could pray for me. And I'm like, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to start reconsidering that. Do you mind if I lay hands on it? Whatever, bro. Do your thing. He's praying for me and cusses in his prayer. Like, what, 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 where have I been my whole life? You need to pray for you. I, 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 I mean, that was, I had never, I mean, I'm 62. I hadn't seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff. I had never seen nothing like that. You're going to be cussing at God, praying for me. Don't pray for me no more. Everything has to match the brand. My son is 34 years old. My daughter is 32. Neither one of them have ever heard me or my wife use profanity. Ever. Ever. How do I know? Because we've never heard us use it. And my brothers, they knew me before the Lord got a hold of me. <laughs> okay, so that's another story for a different day. But since then, they've not heard it. Everything has to match the brand. The words that come out of your mouth have to match the brand. He wrote 3,000 Proverbs, which means he wasn't concerned about what he thought people would think about it. And, but what are people going to think if I put it out there? It's never gonna... Who cares? Put it out there thinking about them, not thinking about you. Get your mind off yourself for a change. I'm so worried about what people are thinking about me. Well, let me be the bringer of, bearer of good news. Ain't nobody thinking about you. They got stuff on their mind that they need to deal with. You are the last. I just can't stand them because what they said. Child, please. Okay, so the words that you say have to match the brand. Then it says, she came to prove him with hard questions. So, so she heard, are the things that come out of your mouth. See, if you are not putting out content that shows people that you have the answers they're looking for, maybe that's why your business is not thriving. If you're not putting out content that lets families know you have the answers that'll make their family life better, maybe that's why your ministry's not thriving. Like, I was talking to somebody yesterday, I don't remember who it was, I was talking to somebody yesterday. Oh, one of my clients, one of my high level VIP clients. I was telling her, I said, here's the thing. I said, I said, somebody said, I don't know if it's true. So I'm just, somebody said, I don't even remember who the person was because I read a lot of stuff and I watch a lot of stuff and I learn a lot of stuff. So I don't remember who said it, um, but I can see where it could be true. That's what I'm going to say about this statement that I'm about to make. They said, they said that, um, that organic content is seven times more effective than paid advertising. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. That's what they said. I, I can see where it could be true. And I, I, can even, I just now figured out a way I could test the validity of that statement. Which means... If you are spending money to acquire a customer in advertising, you have to spend seven times as much as you would have to spend if you spent that money on building out your organic platform. Because either way, it's going to cost you money. Like this YouTube video that I'm creating right now is free for people to consume. But it was not free for me to create. I mean, we had to buy those cameras. We had to buy those lenses. We had to buy these lights, right? And the stuff, right? So it wasn't free. But here's why I believe that free content, the community, what I call community service content, co content that you create to serve the community, why I believe it's more impactful. Because when you buy an ad, when people see an ad, they know that your objective is to sell them something. They know that. And, and, and being human, we don't, I mean, we like buying stuff. I don't know, because we all have stuff that we done bought. 
That's how I know. We like buying stuff, right? And most people hate to sell, and there's only one alternative to selling, and that's buying. So most people only like to buy. Well, good news for all the entrepreneurs in the room, right? Okay, now, the problem is that when I spend money to get you to buy something from me, and you know it's an ad, you're like, oh, they're just trying to sell me something. If nine times out of 10 when you see me, I'm showing up saying, hey, do you wanna buy this? Like if I say, hey, do you wanna buy this? I, Pastor Ron, would you like to buy this? Or would you like to buy these? And then, would you like to buy this? Oh, I have a bottle of water, would you like to buy that? Oh, I have a pack of crackers, would you like to buy that? Oh, I've got this great book, would you like to buy that? Oh, I've got this cool highlighter, would you like to buy that? Oh, I've got this pack of TikTok. Tic Tacs, would you like to buy that? Uh, oh, cool remote, I have no earthly idea what it goes to, but would you like to buy that, right? And so, every time I show up, I'm saying, would you like to buy, would you like to buy, would you like to buy? Now, when you see me, even before a word comes out of my mouth, you're thinking, I'm gonna ask if you'd like to buy. But watch what happens. When I show up and I say, I've got this really, really cool stuff. I've got this for you, and I've got this for you, and I've got this for you, and I've got that for you, and oh, oh, is, hey, I've got that for you. This is great. Good stuff for everybody. There it is. There's some more. I got that. He don't want that. He sells water, and it's way better than that. Okay, so, 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 so if I show up, and every time I show up, I've got gifts. I'm just showing up and giving gifts and giving gifts. People are like, now when they see you, the first thought in their subconscious mind, without them even trying, is... I wonder what gifts he has for me today. Well, no wonder, yeah, of course it would be more impactful. Right? Which is why, and this is just a statement, I'm not, I'm not flexing, but it's why we've been able to do over $15 million this year and the year's not even over, over 16 million now. And the year's not even over and we spent zero dollars on advertising all year. That's, that's unheard of. And I only did it as a test to see if it would work. Next year, we're going to spend some money on ads. <laughs> but, but we will put out 10 pieces of organic content for every one ad we run. Are y'all tracking? Next year. Next year. So all I'm saying is everything has to match the brand. So, so here's, here's, the, here's the issue. Everything has to match the brand, but... Some of you are afraid to put out content because you're afraid you're going to run out of content. What are we going to talk about? There, by the way, any prolific content creator faces that at some point. I remember, so I was an evangelist for a while, and I traveled around the country preaching in churches. Well, if I came up with a new sermon every couple of months, I was good, right? Because people only have to come back once a year. So every, even if I came up with one a month or one every two weeks, then I, this church called me to be the pastor. My number one concern, I'm not even kidding, my number one concern was, I gotta come up with something to talk about three times a week? Like three times a week? I gotta come up with something, no, not three times a week to different people, to the same people! Oh my goodness, what am I gonna say? I don't know if you've ever had that thought, Pastor, but uh, Pastor Ron, when you were a pastor, and to make it worse, much more worse for me. I had people in my church that had been to seminary. I had not been to seminary. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do, right? And then I've got this friend, Kenny Grant, pastor in Savannah. He said, mine, mine, I'm gonna tell you something. You don't have to know more than everybody in your church. All you gotta do is stay a week ahead. I said, I can stay a week ahead. <laughs> I can do that. And I, I, it freed me up so much from worrying about things. I'm, but I've got, I've got some other good news for y'all. If you have been alive for any length of time, for a couple decades or more, you have learned so many things that would be beneficial for other people to know. You just don't value them because you know them. And so you suffer from the most prolific content creation slash business slash ministry disease in the world. It's called I'm just me-itis, inflammation of the I'm just me gland. And if what, what you have, if somebody else had it, you could see the value in it, but you can't see it because it's you. But other people can see it in you, and they tell you that they can see it in you, and you still can't believe them because 
you've bought into the lie of your identity that who you are is not enough. We ain't coming out too strong on Thanksgiving Day, are we? A little bit, a little bit. We coming out, okay, we all right? You all right? Okay, so make sure everything you say matches the brand. Okay, I gotta go on because if I don't, then I'm gonna run over and I told you I was gonna be eight to 40 minutes. Y'all didn't believe me. Okay, so then it says, she came to Jerusalem um, with a very great train and camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, which means he answered all her questions and there was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. Okay, so not only does everything you say have to match the brand, but all of the solutions that you provide have to also match the brand. So, what does that mean? Anybody can build a flash in the pan successful business. If you're gonna build a business long term, eventually, something's gotta work. <laughs> you got people paying you to provide a solution? If, you better figure out something that works. How many of y'all tracking? And so, and so, the greatest promoter of your business, the greatest promotion your business can have is the success of a client by using the product or the service or the solution that you've created. So your results become your brand ambassador. Oh, by the way, they already are. Oh, snap. What do you mean they already are? That means if nobody's walking around talking about how you've helped them, maybe you haven't helped them as much as you thought you had. Mm -hmm. I wish I had them helping here. Oh, la. Your solutions have to match. You know, it's interesting to me. I see these people. Um, I just, I think it was in Jeremiah 17. Um, I was just listening to a passage this morning where it says that if you get riches by and not delivering on the promises that you made, it's not gonna last. I don't, I don't, I don't even remember what the verse was. I wish I, I, I was listening to it while I was getting ready this morning. And, but there are a whole bunch of verses in scripture that teach that, right? You can't, and there are people who sell people stuff because they wanna make money and then they sell people stuff that, that, that either they know doesn't work or they don't know does work. Well, I'm gonna sell this to you, then it's gonna work. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Like, know that the value you're bringing to people is value they desire to have, not just value you desire them to have. So, next is, it says, um, she seen, then it says in verse four, and when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom. And remember I asked the question, what does wisdom look like? When the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom. Hmm. So it's not just what you say, and it's not just the solutions you provide. It's what people see. Huh, that matters. Okay, well, here's what it says. When the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, so she was looking at his environment that he had created. And the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers, the excellence at with which his team operated and their apparel and his cupbearers, and the ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. When she had seen the results of his wisdom, it took her breath away. So what you say has to match the brand, the solutions you create have to match the brand, and what people see when they look at you has to match the brand. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, about what I'm about to say. I was heavily influenced in my earlier entrepreneurial career by a lot of younger entrepreneurs. And I did a lot of presentations in jeans and t-shirts. There's nothing wrong with jeans and t-shirts. But I hired one business coach, Joel, who I just came from a mastermind of his in California. Um, and in his presentation, one, a part of his presentation is wrap the package. That's what he calls it, wrap the package. And he talked about the fact that his grandfather wore suits everywhere. 
He'd go to the butcher shop, he'd wear a suit. He'd go to the grocery store, he'd wear a suit. He traveled on an airplane, he wore a suit. So I, I said, and then he had a video. So Joel had this video. He just showed it this past week too. This homeless guy out begging for money. Nobody would give him money. He said, he took the homeless guy into a thrift shop, bought him a sports coat that was five sizes too big, put some tape around a pack of cigarettes, made it look like a cell phone, put the guy on the same street corner with this fake cell phone up to his ear and the sports coat on and said, hey, could I borrow 50 cents? I need to catch the bus. People just started handing him just because he looked like he didn't need it. My dad was a prophet. He was a plumber, actually, but he was prophetic in his plumbing. (laughs) And he said, boy, I'm going to tell you something. He said, if you look like you ain't got two nickels to rub together, nobody won't want to give you nothing. But if you look like you got everything, people would be the path to you, though, giving you everything. I'm thinking to myself, and I'm in elementary school when he's telling me this. I'm like, what does that mean? I am telling you, I get more free stuff that I didn't ask for than I can count. People send me boxes of Pro V1 golf balls. Now, you may not think that's a big deal. 12 golf balls. Pro V's. George knows he's shaking his head, right? I get free Pro V's all the time. I get at least, from non family members, I get at least three or four dozen Pro V1 boxes of Pro V1 golf balls a year. Pro V1s cost $50 to $60 a box for 12 golf balls. That's just the golf balls people send me. People send me clothes. People send me, I, I can't, in great custom engraved knife sets, just stuff that I didn't ask for. Like, all the time. Art, just all kinds of stuff. Why? Kind of look like I need it. When you, this goes to something I teach in selling. This is human psychology. Basic human psychology. If people feel like, everybody say feel like. If people feel like you need them, they believe they don't need you. I'm going to say that again. If people feel like you need them, they believe they don't need you. But if people feel like you don't need them, they believe they need you. Isn't that fascinating? When I, I, I've only bought $1 million home in my, in my life. In the million dollar house that I used to live in, the lady that sold it to me, she told me, and, she, and another real estate agent told me this too, real estate agents that drive Mercedes sell more houses than real estate agents that don't. Wow. When you look like you got it going on, people want to be in your, it, it, I'm, I get it, it doesn't make sense. I get it, it's not, there, it's, not be, it's just because people are people. One of the things that all of us can do is we can all wrap our package. We can all just like dress better. So I'm I'm gonna end with this story because it's almost time for me to start Bible study. So I'm gonna end with this story. And and I'm gonna finish reading the passage because I wanna show you something mind blowing. Um, I had a seminar I was speaking at in Dallas, Texas. This was, this is the last, no, this is the next to the last time I flew commercial in my life. So it was last May, May of 2022, had a real estate seminar, nonstop flight from Tampa to Dallas. Get to Dallas, my luggage didn't come off. I go report it, okay, we'll deliver it to your room, to your hotel where you're staying, cool. That night it didn't come, the next morning it didn't come. Next morning, I'm speaking at the seminar, 2,200 people. They lost my suitcase. It's called a suitcase. It had my suit in it. But fortunately for me, I travel. When I travel, I wear a suit when I travel. And so I didn't have to go buy a suit. 
I had to wear the same suit two days in a row. Oh, shucks. But, but, but I didn't have to go buy a suit because I wore a suit when I traveled. Look as good as you can. Even if you're wearing casual clothes, look, wrap your package and look as good as, look put together. Now, I'm just, when she saw his wisdom, how did she see it? Well, we read it. Now, here's what she did after she saw all that and he answered all her questions, okay? She said, happy are these thy servants, verse 8, which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Watch this part. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. God didn't put Solomon on the throne of Israel because he loved Solomon. He put Solomon on the throne of Israel because he loved Israel. Can God trust you enough to put you in a position to demonstrate love to his people because of the, the, because of the platform that he sat you on? Okay, watch this. And she gave King Solomon 120 talents of gold and spices very great store and precious stones, and there came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Let me ask you a question. Did King Solomon need the Queen of Sheba's 120 talents of gold, yes or no? No, he didn't need it. So here's our problem in the West. When we read about the Queen of Sheba giving King Solomon the 120 talents of gold, we don't have any idea how much that is, so we just keep reading. So shall we do some math? Can we do some math? Everybody, let's do some math. We're going to do it fast. It's got to be fast math. I'm going to let you all do the math on your own because I got to go. So here it is. You ready? A A talent weighed between 68 and 74 pounds. Let's just call it 70 pounds. 70 pounds. There's 16 ounces in a pound. Okay? So if we take 16 times 70 times 120, and then we multiply that times the current price of gold, which is almost $2,000, I'm sure. I don't remember. I don't know exactly how much it is right now. Um, okay, times the current price of gold is $1,995. You should come up with somewhere between $253 million and $260 something million. $268 million, $100 something dollars. That's one client. King Solomon consulted all of the kings and queens of the earth. Let that grow on you. Everything has to match the brand. And in the words of my brother Jeff, he told me this a long time ago. He said, man, I'm going to tell you something. Everything, says to your, everything about you says to your customer, either buy from me or don't buy from me. Whether your shoes are shined, whether your hair is cut, whether your face is clean, if your suit is pressed, if your shirt is wrinkled, everything says buy from me or don't buy from me. You can't afford to have anything say don't buy from me. And on that, we will end. Make sure everything matches the brand. Thank you.